Uh, no, no, it's cool. Sorry, it, it's cool. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Sorry, when I heard I was talking today, I didn't know I'd be following a future astronaut and someone who makes organs for a living. Um, for the most part, I'm just a technical geek, so up front, I want to apologize for the next 10 minutes. Um, 10 minutes is interesting because it's not really enough time to learn anything, and for the most part, you're just kind of hoping um, that you'll be entertained. But almost the central point of what I want to talk about today is that we're spending too much time being entertained and not enough time um, actually being educated. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about it um, when we talk about cyber war, but if there's two takeaways today, one of them is that we need to knuckle down and spend more time actually learning stuff. Um, so cyber war gets thrown around a lot. It started getting used a lot in 2007 uh, because of what happened in Estonia. So I'm not sure how many of you are familiar. The Estonians moved a monument to a cemetery. Um, the Russians took deep offense to it. Um, and they started a denial of service attack against the Estonians. So uh, it was all over the news. Essentially, people in Estonia couldn't bank, couldn't use government systems. Um, pretty much the internet came to a standstill for them. And then after that, um, it sprung to the news when everyone would have heard of Stuxnet. Okay, in 2010, the news came out of this worm that was written by USA and Israel um, that was set against the Iranian nuclear program, so targeting Boucher and Natanz. And uh, according to reports, set the nuclear program back uh, about three years. And then in 2013, um, this guy made hacking and internet security completely famous. Um, for those of you who don't recognize him, where were you? Um, so, so that's Snowden. Um, at the time, a 29-year-old contractor working for the US government. Um, and what he did was he, he released a whole bunch of uh, documents to a bunch of reporters. And these documents went through a whole number of attacks that had been done over the past few years and showed a whole bunch of the Five Eyes. So the Five Eyes is the uh, spying alliance, um, USA, UK, New Zealand. Um, and it showed that, that some of the uh, attacks against uh, different countries in the world. So uh, the Snowden leaks were super interesting. I'm not sure if you guys saw, uh, this was the one against the G20, um, where they showed that a bunch of uh, analysts were used to spy on the G20 summit. So you had these guys that were in real time feeding information back to analysts to give them a trade advantage. They did a bunch of interesting things. They compromised people's Blackberries. They put up fake kiosks uh, around the G20, so when people used them, um, they'd get compromised. Um, and there were a whole bunch of interesting things that came out of the Snowden docs, including that they'd compromised the offices of the European Union. They compromised interesting uh, other organizations. Um, and uh, for geeks like me, you saw a whole bunch of technical tools that were interesting. Um, so you found out that you could buy a USB cable that was actually a microwave transmitter. So even though it looked like a regular cable when you plugged it into your machine, um, NSA trucks would drive past and be sucking up information from your machine off these cables. Um, and one of the side effects of this is that this whole cottage industry sprang up of people trying to build phones and messengers that were now NSA-proof. And for the most part, what I'm saying today is that all of this stuff is actually a distraction and should be ignored. Because if you want to talk about where the real power comes from in cyber war, there's something more subtle than this, and you have to read a little bit between the lines. For the most part, what all of us are doing when we're talking about getting a secure messenger or buying a secure computer is moving around the deck chairs while the Titanic is sinking. Okay, it might make you feel like you're doing something, but you're not making any significant dent in the problem. And um, if you want to see a, a taste of what this looks like, if you read between the lines, this is a headline from about three weeks ago, two weeks ago, where the US government has now officially kicked out Kaspersky antivirus. 
from running on DHS and US government computers. Okay, so you guys might have heard of Kaspersky. They're one of the big names, so Trend, Symantec, Kaspersky. Um, and this thing of preventing foreign software from running on your servers um, has happened before, right? A little while back, the Australian government stopped the sale or stopped buying Huawei equipment on key government backbones. And what I'm saying is, this stuff should make you stop and think a little. Okay, because the Snowden leaks showed us that the US government was not afraid to make use of their software companies to further their aims. Um, if you guys don't recognize this, we were introduced to a new term called interdiction, where you order Cisco, before the Cisco comes to you, it stops at an interdiction plant, they implant your Cisco with their software, and by the time you buy your software, it's actually their software. Um, there were other examples, a whole bunch of them, where they worked with Skype, where they worked with Microsoft, um, where they worked with a bunch of different players. I like this one. Um, this was Microsoft in particular, where uh, essentially, if you read through the whole boring thing, Microsoft says, we introduced SSL so the FBI could no longer spy on Skype, but don't worry, we made the necessary changes. You guys can spy on it again. Um, and this stuff isn't a uh, tinfoil hattery, right? This is from the Snowden leaks. Um, it's got the badges uh, to give it its credibility. Um, now, why I say this should have you thinking is because what the Five Eyes did when they kicked out Huawei and when they kicked out Kaspersky is said to us that they don't trust foreign-made software. And during the Snowden leaks, what we saw is that they use their software when they need to spy on people. So where does that actually leave us? Because right now, we're almost completely dependent on foreign-made software. Okay, um, a long time ago, Richard Stallman had a quote that said that if your government wasn't running their computers on software that they controlled, essentially you've got no software sovereignty, and this is a matter of national security. Um, so almost everyone goes to, we should build our own Silicon Valley, okay? And over time, you'll see almost everyone uh, writes an article saying they're building their Silicon Valley. And as many stories like that exist, you get stories that say Silicon Valley can't be copied. And one of the key reasons for this is because people forget where Silicon Valley actually came from. Um, Steve Blank gives a really nice presentation called The Secret History of Silicon Valley where he points out that Silicon Valley was originally Microwave Valley, okay? And it was born um, essentially by uh, Fred Terman and Will Shockley, who saw the opportunity to provide technology to the US war effort, okay? So Silicon Valley was born to serve the US war effort. And uh, at that point, so, so VCs did step in, but the first generation of it was build us microwave technology to, to work in war. And even today, um, this is kind of a big part of Silicon Valley. I'm not sure how many of you recognize InQtel. InQtel is a super interesting company, so they're not a secret. You can go online and see, and you'll see that InQtel says that they are not for profit organization that fund companies to build the technology needed by the intelligence community. Okay, essentially, InQ tells a big VC that sponsors companies, gives them customers, but essentially to serve uh, the IC effort. Now, what's interesting is, if you take a look at most modern security companies that come out of the US, what you'll find is almost all of them, D-Wave, Red Seal, Tenable, Threat Matrix, Palanta, all have come up through this uh, funding effort that's uh, essentially through the intelligence agencies. Um, now this is, there's nothing insidious about it, it's actually a good strategy. And you see other com countries starting to do the same. So France published their national strategy where they say, listen, right now most of the InfoSec players are dominated outside Europe, that's not something that we want. What we're going to do is start looking at our small companies and start building them up. So we will buy France, we'll serve France, and, and that's the way to go. And the question then is, is this something that we can do? 
Is this something that the rest of us can do, can, that developing nations can do? And the important thing that we seem to be missing is developers, okay? We just don't have the number of developers that we need. From a show of hands, how many people here identify as developers? You, you make software for a living. I think maybe five in the whole audience. Um, and uh, essentially, what I'm saying is that this is not tenable, okay? It's keeping us almost permanently dependent. And this is a serious problem. Um, right now, though, there is one quick solution in the form of open source software. I'll go through this really quickly because I'm, all, I'm out of time. Um, open source software, if I suggested it to you a few years ago, you'd say Linux is hard to use, uh, that's not really that cool. But today, if you recognize Google or Amazon, you know that they're running on open source software. If you're watching videos, you're probably watching it on VLC. Okay, if you're using Safari, it's built on open source software. When Apple wanted a new operating system, what they did was they took open source BSD, embraced it, extended it, and made OS X. When Google found themselves behind the game for an operating system for a cell phone, they took open source Android um, and extended it. So this concept of taking open source stuff to get a jump start and then building on it is an interesting one. If you take small developing countries, Brazil can't build their own operating system. They don't have the people. But what they can do is take an open source system and start building on it. South Africa can't build a Skype competitor. But what we can do is fund an open source project and patron it. And essentially what that means is in the short term, we're not completely dependent on something foreign. In the medium term, we start growing local developers who can work on this technology. And in the long term, maybe we finally find a way to just not be completely dependent on others. But in part, what it needs most is for you guys, for us, for the youth, to show up and start doing development. Okay, uh, and development is interesting these days because you can exist on the internet and think you're doing stuff. But actually what you're doing is just consuming. At, at our ages, Mark Zuckerberg built Facebook. Um, in the same position, what we're doing is using Facebook. And there's a fundamental difference, and this stuff's gonna bite. Um, so in summary, um, you've got some countries treating cyberspace like it's one of their colonies. And you'll know from history that most colonies don't end up doing so well. Um, we almost completely dependent right now on software written by other people. Um, governments have a part to play. They've got to take active steps to start to promote local development. But we've got a part to play. Um, and we need to start learning that we have to produce more than we consume. Um, there's no time for questions, but if you guys uh, tweet at me, you can tell me why I'm stupid. Um, thanks a lot for your time. <laughs>